morning. Beautiful day. Not very sunny though. I'm praying for some rain here in California. Allergies are kicking in. All these trees around here are prematurely uh, putting out their pollen and such because of the dry weather. So hopefully we get some rain. It's looking pretty, pretty cloudy up there. We'll see what happens. Uh, I want to talk about mycology. I, uh, I think it's one of the most fascinating topics that anybody can look into. Um, I got into mycology from being raised celebrating Christmas and, and uh, being bewildered by the, the mythological holiday stories that were told. So as I got older, I wanted to understand, uh, you know, what it was all about, uh, especially Christmas and the Christmas trees and the decorations and Santa Claus and that whole story. It, you know, I've covered covered the topic of Santa in some of my other videos, and, and uh, kind of a longer extended version. But uh, you know, uh, it, it's kind of a shame that. As children, we learn these things, but we don't graduate as we get older and research it to figure out what it means. But uh, mycology touches on so many different things. Uh, but uh, just just let's look at the mushroom spore. It's coated. I've got, got hummingbirds joining me this morning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The the mushroom spore has the ability to withstand the temperatures of outer space. Um, so right now there could be millions of different types of mushroom spores drifting throughout outer space and there's the hardest, one of the hardest biological substance on the planet is the casing of these shells which would actually help them penetrate atmospheres and fall into planets into the Goldilocks positions. And they're the grand molecular deconstructions of nature. They, they come down into the atmosphere and they break down the rocks and they they deposit, uh, you know, they, they strip carbons out of the, out of the dirt, and clean the environments. They create a biosphere. Uh, and they leave behind proteins essential for life. Uh, some of the biggest organisms on the planet are mushrooms or mycelium patches, and some of the oldest um, organisms on the planet were giant um, mushrooms and mycelium patches. Um, from millions and millions of years ago when the Earth was just developing. And then, uh, you know, it's also cool that they, they, they can lay dormant for billions of years until they find just the right uh, conditions to pop up and do their thing. Um, they break down the forest floor and they distribute nutrients. The algorithms that the mycelium uses to distribute the nutrients amongst the forest floor is the same algorithms that were used to communicate on them. And the computer, the fruit of knowledge. Uh, so many of these mushrooms can be used to heal us, to enlighten us, to uh, just just food. As a hunters and gatherers, uh, they were essential. Some of these mushrooms grew to the size of dinner plates and turned into cups and grails. Uh, we could drink the morning dew out of them and have experiences. It's all fascinating when you get into all the roots of all the religions around the world. And, you know, I get labeled as a conspiracy theorist sometimes because I talk about this stuff, but uh, I just study history. You know, I went to college to study a lot of this stuff, and a lot of times when you start quoting stuff from the past or you start digging up history, people think you're a conspiracy theorist, people think you're trying to make up a bunch of stuff, but, uh, you know, um, one of these days I believe that the you know, understand, understanding of mycology will help us fix this planet. I mean, people like Paul Stamet, the work he's doing with uh, mushrooms and cleaning up carbon out of soil, and, and I mean, it, it's just amazing stuff. Um, it's the fruit of knowledge to me, and it is the, you know, we were seeking this fountain of youth, and I believe it's somewhere out there. Uh, mushrooms, of course, or fountains are designed after mushrooms, and it's a it's, an, it's a reference to a mushroom moon as we're speaking of fountains. Um, so it's, it's all really fascinating stuff. 
and uh, I've had the most spiritual and amazing experiences in my life and connecting with the earth through them and seeing things differently. Um, it's such an amazing thing. Um, I really believe that they help to develop our frontal lobe. I, 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 I really, after studying some of Terence McKenna's work and, and his stoned ape theory, I believe that there's something to it. Uh, all the fundamental religions are wrapped up into it. Uh, this is Krishna's umbrella. This is uh, the holy sacrament and the holy cow and the holy shit. <laughs> it's the sacraments under the Christmas trees. It's just an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. Um, the Eurasian and Siberian shaman discovered this and uh, one of the you know, biggest religious holidays is wrapped up into it. It's mythological stories and we don't know it, but basically we got it we should teach our children. I don't have children, but I think it'd be best to teach our children as we get older that this is real. Um, if you study these ancient cultures you can find out what all this stuff means. And it's not conspiracy theory, it's just history. And it's something we should graduate and grow up and learn. But to tell our children that it's fake and it's all BS, and we wonder why they rebel in their early teens, you know, maybe there's has something to do with it. Um, and it's sad when there, there's not a lot of mycologists out there, which I consider them today's modern shamans. Um, it's a field that... I think is could really use some diving into to further the advancements of humanity. Uh, but uh, and what I mean by saying that it's real is just, the story is an allegory, but it's truth. You know, during the winter solstice, the shamans would, uh, who were the medicine men or the, the leaders of the tribes, would ride out in the forest. They had experience of all this stuff. They would uh, take their reindeers and their sleighs out in the conifer tree lines. You know, anybody who's probably watching this has heard these stories, but people just don't get it. Uh, these shaman would, would use the reindeer to help collect the mushrooms at the bottom of the of the trees, and you know, the Rudolph would get a chap nose; his nose would turn red from digging in the snow. And sometimes he would ingest one of these mushrooms and because it had not gone through decarboxylation uh, through his liver. He doesn't necessarily get the effects he's left out of the reindeer games, but when he urinates and the other reindeer were to come up and eat the yellow snow, they would be intoxicated and prancing and dashing and dancing around. Well, the shaman knows that he's got to go through decarboxylation to make them safe to consume for humans. Um, <coughs> so he'd stick them up into the boughs of the trees and he'd let them dry in the sun. He'd eventually put these into his sack and ride back into our villages and, uh, you know, ring a bell, climb up on the yurt, which was his the chimney of the yurts was the secondary axis of the front door snowed in and we would barter you know milk and cookies or whatnot and get these sacraments and dry them out in our stockings so they can go through decarboxylation uh, Easter hunt all this stuff it's all tied up into it and uh, ultimately is I think the reason that time developed through these things too is because I noticed that uh, if you take a good amount of sacraments and you're out in nature you want to be out early in the morning there's something called the axis mundi and it's really awesome and this is how you can actually get your body in tuned into the frequency to see the earth a little bit differently when you when you take these you know some people can meditate and have the ability to write you know uh, elevate their own tryptamine levels in their body um, which is this, which is the core spirit molecule that's found in many of these sacraments um, or you know the ayahuasca vines, or it just depends on what culture you're at they find how they found it. Um, but the axis mundi is something that is what you can do is you find the northern star when you're when you have these tryptamines elevated in your body and your eyes are preternaturally dilated and you stare at the northern star for hours until you start to see tracers and what I mean is the northern star will be the pivotal point and you see all the other stars instead of just you'll actually be able to watch the earth spinning and that's when you know that you've lowered your vibrations or you've come down into 
a frequency where you can see the world. And you know, <laughs> this is going to sound all crazy to people who aren't initiated or people who have not been experienced or know what I'm talking about if they haven't studied mycology and shamanism and, and, and having a Christ consciousness and all stuff. And I get attacked from Christians all the time. Uh, I also learned about you can get the same experience through fasting. But if you fast and you anoint your head, like Jesus says in the book of Matthew, um, you really have an experience. Um, so, if you focus your attention on the northern star, the Axis Mundi, and you just stare at it for long enough, your eyes get preternaturally dilated, you're just letting a lot more light in, and it's kind of like time-lapse photography. All of a sudden you start to see the stars spinning around the central location. And then you can understand how over thousands of years they developed the procession and, and of the equinox uh, and how they've kept track of celestial movements for so long because they literally focused on it and slowed themselves down. And then another beautiful thing that will happen if you can hold that, this frequency where, you're at, where your vision is literally slowed down, your breathing is slowed down, um, just before the sun rises, um, the Earth's electromagnetic field comes roaring back. It's called pre-dawn electromagnetic induction. And that's our opportunity where we can see the dragon lines or the ley lines in the sky if you're it's still in this frequency. So take your attention away from the northern star, the Axis Mundi, and look to the dog star, the eastern star. And as the eastern star rises, or just look to the east wherever the sun will be rising. And shortly before sunrise, as the Earth's electromagnetic field is, uh, is strengthening, it just so happens is ionization is occurring in the sky and the dew is falling which was considered the uh, semen of the ancient sun gods that fertilized the ground and, and gave birth to these sacraments. Um, the ionization is occurring during the pre-dawn electromagnetic induction. The dew falls out of the sky, it feeds the mycelium floor, and most of the uh, mycelium patches will pop up their, their, the, the mushrooms. And then, you know, of course, you have your first stage, which is the Easter egg, and then it turns into the table or the towel. Or, cross top mushroom and then it turns into the bowl or the grail. Um, so take your attention off of the Axis Mundi once you've actually seen the what I call the time lapse delay in our eyes where you can see the tracers of all the other stars moving around that pivotal point. And then you know that you're in the right frequency. And then look to the look to the east when the sun's rising. And if you can hold that you'll see the whole world kind of change. We see everything three-dimensionally in condensed particles. Um, they theorized about atoms years and years and years before we built a machine. And that's because when you're in this state of consciousness, you, uh, you see everything vibrating. You see everything... Um, uh, anything that has life in it is emitting light. And anything that's, that's dead or dying like an old log or anything is just shimmering and you could, it feels like the particles are trying to break free you know, or return to source or whatnot. It's pretty wild. But when you look up into the sky at this moment, you can see grid lines. You see energy streaking through the sky if you're in this frequency. You, if you have anybody around you, you might catch their auras and their chakra colors and all this stuff and sometimes see this faint little string, this little purple tether, this silver cord that kind of dangles up out of the top of our head and goes up into the atmosphere. Sounds crazy. Just been there and experienced it myself. And so have many ancient cultures, but to the average person they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But this is how the birds and the bees and the animals migrate. You know, they're in tune. When their third eye is open, they see the world differently, just like we have the ability to. Also in Matthew, Jesus says, when you're, you know, when you're one eye, be single, you be full of light, lest you be full of light. Trust me, it's beautiful. But a lot of people have internal trips. When their tryptamines levels rise up, they deal with ego and they go inside and it's full of darkness. So, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just trying to share this with people that maybe somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's a really beautiful thing. Sacred geometry just unfolds in front of you. You see crystalline geometry everywhere. Um, it's also the time during that induction is when we're, most of us are asleep and we're in heavy REM and we're producing our own tryptamines or dimethyltryptamine and we're dreaming. So, I don't know. I just thought I'd share this mycology, shamanism, um, 
they, all the ancient mythological stories and stuff are grounded in something. Uh, it's, it's an alternative view. Uh, maybe some people don't know what I'm talking about. And I apologize if you don't get it, but, uh, you know, no conspiracy theory, just experience and studying history. It's really cool. Uh, if anybody's ever willing to try it through their own course of meditation or by taking that trip to the top of the mountain through a catalyst, you know, I suggest practicing on the Axis Mundi and developing, uh, and you'll know when you're in that frequency because you'll see it. You'll see the, the stars slowly moving around and it starts to look like you're in Star Trek, like taking off in the Millennium Falcon or something. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. Namaste. Have a beautiful day, people. One love.